Before assessing and looking for signs of airway compromise, it is worth reviewing the main features of the upper airway. The upper airway comprises of the nasal and oral cavities, the pharynx and the larynx. Select each of the links to find out more. The nasal cavity is divided by the septum and is connected to the pharynx through two openings called the internal nares. The roof of the nose is formed by the ethmoid bone at the base of the skull and the floor is formed by the hard and soft palates of the roof of the mouth. The nose cavity is lined with ciliated mucous membrane. This membrane is extremely vascular and atmospheric air is warmed as it passes over the epithelium. The pharynx or throat is comprised of three sections, the last of which is the larynx. The uppermost portion, the nasopharynx, lies behind the nose. The pharyngeal tonsil or adenoids are situated on the posterior wall of the nasopharynx. The oropharynx lies below the level of the soft palate, and this is where the tonsils are situated. This is part of the respiratory and alimentary tract. It is not possible to swallow and breathe at the same time because the oropharynx is blocked off from the nasal pharynx by the raising of the soft palate when swallowing occurs. The larynx or voice box is a short passageway that connects the pharynx with the trachea. It is composed of nine pieces of irregular shaped cartilages that are joined together by ligaments and membrane. Vocal cords stretch across the floor of the larynx and vibrate as air passes between them. The thyroid cartilage is formed by two flat pieces of cartilage fused at the front to form the laryngeal prominence or Adam's apple. The epiglottis is a large piece of cartilage that sits on the tip of the larynx. When we swallow, the free edge pulls down over the glottis, thus preventing food from going down the trachea. The jaw thrust manoeuvre is an effective airway technique, particularly in the patient in whom cervical spine injury is a concern. This manoeuvre requires the continual support from the practitioner to stabilise the patient and can be tiring after a short time, as a constant force has to be maintained to ensure the tongue is lifted and projected forward. As such, this can be an uncomfortable procedure for both patient and practitioner, and should be practised. The manoeuvre prevents any movement of the cervical spine. Take note of the hand and finger positioning in the image shown. Bag valve mask ventilation is commonly found in clinical areas and is therefore a useful adjunct until advanced resuscitation equipment arrives. With the establishment of a patent airway, Supplementary assistance in the form of oxygen should be provided to support respiratory effort and maintain tissue perfusion. By increasing oxygen flow, the concentration of inspired oxygen can be increased to 90%, but even using atmospheric air, it can provide higher inspired oxygen concentration than expired air ventilation. This method, which relies on the use of an appropriately sized mask and maintaining a seal around patient's face, generally requires two hands. This technique is therefore difficult and less effective if performed unassisted. If a second person is available, it is recommended that one person manages the mask and the airway while the second person squeezes the bag to ventilate the chest. Compression of the bag should be gauged to achieve adequate chest rise.